Hello everyone and welcome to another weekly video update. Now last week there was an interesting piece of news. Ohio Governor Mike DeWine tested positive for coronavirus. But the next day he tested negative. So this was a false alarm. The second test was done using an RT-PCR test, which we know is a gold standard for coronavirus testing right now. So a negative on that test is a fairly good indication that he actually is negative and he doesn't have any symptoms at the same time. Guess what? The first test he did was done on a rapid antigen test. There are only two of them in the marketplace and I've covered both of them in my prior videos. I do not know which particular test was done for him, but it has to be one of the two. A false negative on a, on a rapid antigen test is expected and understandable because these rapid antigen tests do not have a high sensitivity. But a false positive actually is very surprising and I was very intrigued by it. I started thinking and I put together a few ideas and thoughts in this particular video but I would love for you to share your thoughts and expertise in your comments so all of us can understand this a little bit better. So let's just take a look at what I came up with and maybe we understand this mystery a little bit better. Uh, just free thinking, brainstorming about potential causes for false positive results. Contamination comes to mind first. The swab may be contaminated, the reagents may be contaminated, and the testing area might be contaminated and this contamination can transfer to a sample being tested so the result may be positive. The reader can malfunction. Maybe the display is wrong. Maybe the analyzer is not working properly and displaying a wrong result. Use error has a lot of possibility. Maybe there are unclear directions, many steps, staff is overworked or they lack training. There might be other scenarios as well, but use error is also quite possible. And finally, there might be other unknown infections that we have not characterized. Cross reactivity to other unknown bacteria or viruses. And now these tests have been characterized against many known bacteria and viruses, but you never know if there might be anything new or not. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at the two tests that have been authorized so far. The first one came out from Quadel in May and the second one from Bacton Dickinson in July. So let's look at this sensitivity, which is a positive agreement. It said 84%, meaning 26 out of the 31 known positive samples tested positive in this test. So you get a positive agreement or sensitivity of 84%. Quadel Sophia, 47 out of 59 were tested positive. So you have a sensitivity of 80%, so about the same. Specificity is negative agreement. So in the case of Becton Dickinson's test, 195 of the confirmed negative te samples tested negative. So you have 100% uh, sensitive uh, specificity. Quadel Sophia, 84 out of the 84 known negative samples tested negative. Let's look at their positive predictive value at a disease prevalence of 5%. Now this is an indicator that I really pay attention to and I, I've talked about this in great detail in other videos. For the Becton Dickinson test, it's at 100% because guess what? Specificity being 100%, there are no false positives. Quadel Sophia is also at 100%, no false positives. NPV is negative predictive value and that's at 99.7 and 98.9. So on the surface, these numbers look very good and of course this data was used by the FDA to authorize these tests to go forward, knowing the benefit risk ratio. So uh, think about what happens if specificity is not 100%. Let's say instead of 84 out of 84 testing negative, we just have one false positive or two false positives. What happens? What happens to our positive value? So I did this analysis in this next chart. At the, at the top right, 0 out of 84, that's a specificity of 100% and you get a positive predictive value of 100% at 5% prevalence. If 1 out of 84 is a false positive or 2 or 3 or 5, PPV comes crashing down to as low as 40% and even lower in the 95% confidence interval. So the worst case could be 20%. Specificity still looks good, said so 94%. So on surface it might look good but a positive test may not indicate a true positive if we have this 
rate of false positives. Now we all know that limited amount of testing was done in the beginning, right? And it all looked good. This is what we mean by monitoring real world performance. Good news is that this information is available on FDA's adverse events reporting website, MOD, and I did go there. And sure enough, there have been reports of false positives over the last couple of months. It wasn't until Mike Dwine's false positive that we learned about this. So it's not really open public information. Someone has to go digging into this. We have to do better to understand the real world performance of these tests and maybe apply more controls to make sure they are working accurately. Accessibility to testing is very, very important, very critical. However, inaccurate tests are also not very useful. And FDA knows that. I think they look at the benefit risk. Keep in mind, benefit risk evolves over time as new information becomes available. So they should require more controls. And in, in extreme situations, and they have done so, deauthorize, delist some of these products from the market because it will do more harm than good. So I hope things will get better, but the bottom line is we have to monitor the real world performance of these products and take appropriate action. So this is uh, what I thought about and hopefully this makes sense, but I would love to hear your thoughts and comments about this. Because together we can learn more from each other. You may have expertise or insights that I may have missed or I may have done something incorrectly. So just let me know. I welcome your thoughts and comments. Stay connected with me. Let me know what's on your mind. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and share these videos with friends because I've been making them on a weekly basis, mainly from the pur purpose of informing people in a, in a deeper way, which makes more sense to all of us. And I'll show you very quickly how you can find my YouTube channel. You can go to YouTube and look for Exceed QM Naveen Agarwal PhD and my channel will come up. Or you can follow me on LinkedIn because whenever I post a video, I also give you a link back to my channel. Please let me know what's on your mind, any questions or any topics, COVID related topics or other medical device related topics you want me to talk about. I really want to thank you for your support and encouragement and attention to these videos. I really appreciate that. And finally, I hope all of you are staying safe. Thank you.